Hey everyone, welcome to the video for section 9.8. So in this section we're talking about the last section of the book is about more chaotic solutions, more chaos, more what are actually called strange attractors. It's actually the word for them. Um, and what can happen in higher systems with high, no, bigger numbers of functions. So it turns out as you add more functions, not only things get more complex in terms of just doing calculation, but the types of behaviors you can get also become more complex. So we're going to take some time in this video just to sort of hit one example of that and how things can get really kind of weird when you get into um, functions, more functions in your system. So let's go ahead and start talking about that. So as I mentioned before, so systems with more functions get more complex, get more complicated. And this is not just in computation, but in behavior as well. So the example we're going to see here is that once you get to systems that have three functions in them, you can get chaotic behavior. And so we saw a little bit of chaos in section 2.9 where you have this random oscillation that's not really periodic and it's really sensitive condition conditions. We're going to see that again here, but now for actual ODEs instead of just these difference equations that we had before. So the first big example, and the only one we're really going to talk about in this class, is chaotic solutions. So the main example that shows this is what are called the Lorentz equations. Lorenz, Lorenz, I'm not sure how to say that. And these guys are used to model um, convective flow, convective fluid flow in a gas of the atmosphere where you have a range of temperatures. So if you have a temperature gradient, it produces a convective flow because if the hot air is at the bottom, it wants to go to the top. So it's going to go up and induce a convective flow where things start moving around. And as the temperature gradient gets bigger, you end up getting turbulent flow and things get kind of crazy. So the equations we get are ones that look like this. So here are your parameters. They depend on different things. Um, they, they mean different things in the system. One of them is like the temperature gradients. The other is the actual flow of the fluid. And what we're looking at here is sigma and B are fixed parameters. Um, they have values like sigma is what, 10 thirds, and B is something else for the atmosphere, whatever. They're fixed parameters. And R depends on the temperature gradient. So the main thing we're interested in is how do the solutions change as we change R? So as you make the temperature gradient more intense, how do these solutions change? So you can do the Jacobi analysis on this. What we end up seeing is that for r less than 1, there's only one critical point. And for r bigger than 1, I have 3. Now, the book goes through all the analysis for how you deal with the stability of these guys and figure out what kind of critical points they are and that kind of thing. It's a three-dimensional problem, so it's more difficult to solve. But the book goes through all the analysis if you want to go look at that. The, the point is the stability of these critical points changes with r. So as you change r, you're going to get different types of stability out of these critical points. Now, as R gets really, really big, we come to a really, really interesting situation. So for R bigger than like 24.1 or something, they have the number in the book, then we have this situation. We have three critical points, all of which are unstable. So if you have three points they could go to, but all of them are unstable, you're thinking, okay, they have to run away and go to infinity because there's nowhere for them to converge to. That's a problem though. All solutions remain bounded as T goes to infinity. So they stay in within some ball around the origin. So I have three critical points, none of which are stable, so I can't converge to any of those. And I can't run away to infinity either because I have to stay bounded. So what's going to happen? And what really happens here is this is where you start getting the chaos that sort of comes up. So the solution for what happens is chaos because I can't converge anywhere and I can't go up to infinity. So I have to sort of scatter around do random things. And that's when you get this chaotic behavior of solutions. So it turns out that with this setup, there is what's called an attracting set, which has zero volume. This is like our limit cycle thing from before. Our the limit cycle wasn't an attracting set, but this is not going to be a cycle because this has really, really weird structure to which the solution will eventually converge. This is called a strange attractor. And the solutions that do this are chaotic solutions. All right, so we have our chaos thing coming back in from before. So again because it's chaotic it's hard to do anything by hand with this so we're gonna now jump to maple look at some maple stuff and see what the stuff looks like in maple for doing this sort of problem all right so here's maple code that's going to set up the exact problem here so i have the lde system which is my um lorentz equations i set my value s my value b and my value r here and then we're going to solve the equation so i have this all set up in one line of code so it's going to run all at once so let's set r to be 15. So 15 is well less than 20, so we can run this. There's our equations, and now I want to see what happens. So I have some initial conditions here. We're going to show some graphs, and let's see what this looks like. So for what these graphs are is two different initial conditions, and what happens to them? 
So if R is 15, then I'm going to have some stability in my critical points. That's what we see here is that the solution ends up converging to somewhere stable. So this is a graph of the x function as time goes on. This is an overlay graph of the two different functions with the different solutions. And this is a plot of x versus y as time goes on. So for this case where R is 15, it converges. It's going to a stable point, going to a stable point, and this looks like converging on this midpoint here. Now remember, in this case, curves can cross because I have a z-coordinate as well. With the z-coordinate, they can't cross, but this one they can. So let's make R a little bigger and see what happens. If I up R to 20, again, I get stability, but you can see with this blue curve, the blue curve has a second initial condition. There's a little bit of chaos going on. It does a little random oscillation and then eventually you know, tapers off. Same thing here. You know, It does its thing, and then it ends up converging over here somewhere else. But now the big thing is let's make R bigger. Let's make R28. Now we're in a full-blown sort of chaos setup here where the solution is just chaotic. In nature, it's doing random oscillations. It looked like it was going to be stable for a while and then it starts oscillating randomly and chaotic and you get the strange attractor sort of picture that you get here that you've seen also in the book. I just emphasize the point, we're going to do the initial condition again because remember the, the thing we had for chaotic solutions before was they were also super sensitive to initial conditions. So let's see how that looks. So your initial conditions are 3, 8, and 0. So let's set this one to be 3.01, 8, and 0. So we're off by 0 0.01 in the x. And let's see what I get if I graph them on top of each other. And yet, as expected again, the solutions stay very, very close for a while. There's blue and red on this graph. And after about t equals 30, they're just different. They're entirely different, and there's nothing to relate the two to each other. So we're in the same situation where we had the same type of chaos we had before, where you've got both the sensitivity to initial conditions and you've got the weird oscillations that are kind of random and aren't really predictable. So there's the idea of chaos in actual ODEs. You need, you need three equations to make this happen, but once you have three equations, you can get the sort of chaotic behavior that shows up. And I know some of the meteorological people are really happy because that is like the main meteorological application because that's, they mentioned in the book, that this is generally used for the atmosphere and for weather patterns. So if it's chaotic, there's no point doing long-term prediction because you predict too far away, you don't know what you're going to get into after long times because it could be chaotic and be something completely different than what you had before. All right, so that is it for this video, and that's it for this section. So there'll be some problems for in class where I haven't decided, figured what, as of recording, I don't know what they're going to be yet, but there'll be some problems for you guys to work on on things like this and other stuff for this uh, chapter. So thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.